Where's your coffee? Do you have the coffee? I do. All right, yeah. we'll get the coffee. Yeah. Get the coffee. soldier in there. Right. Let's just start. What's up, everyone? I'm Ola England, and welcome to Coffee with Ola. Today, I'm very happy to have a very special guest of mine, Erman Hamidovich of Systematic Productions. You pronounced it all correctly. That was the I first did? time in my life ever. That I ever did, or that someone? That anyone ever did. Okay, so this is shit. the first. I'm good with that. You know, I'm really good with Cyrillic names as well. Um, I'm a Russian. I, yes, I've, I've seen your pronunciation. You're, you're fantastic. Thank you're better you. than me, even. Thank yeah. you yeah. so much. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm, I'm not cold anymore. Your <laughs> apartment's really nice and warm, and your, your throne room's really bright, and it's all fantastic, yeah. So, Erman is uh, an incredible producer engineer that mixed uh, a lot of really awesome albums and mastered a lot of uh, awesome albums as well. You worked with, like, per obviously, you worked with me. He mastered and mixed Masters of the Universe, my new solo album. And uh, you also mastered Feared, Stem Mastered, I yep. think. And, uh, yep. But he also mastered like stuff from Periphery, Devin Townsend, yep. North Lane. I mean, it's a pretty big list. Did I leave any one out? Uh, it was like Devin Townsend, I think, recently. We did Cynic as well, um, Architects. I think you Sixth? Mastered. Yeah, Sixth. We did Sixth as well. That was fantastic. Awesome album. Uh, a couple of like metalcore bands like uh, Bleed From Within. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, recently from Sorrow to Serenity. Pliny as well. A bit of the prog stuff. Right. Like Checo and all kinds of things. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a good couple of years, I think. Awesome. That's yeah. cool. And uh, one funny thing about me and Erman and our situation is that we're both like really early adapters of the forum format. <laughs> I mean, back when, uh, when did you start at the Andy Sneep forum? I think you said it before, it was... I, I did, I said it wrong though, it would have been the tail end of 2002. Okay, yep. and I'm, I was a part of Andy Sneep forum since 2001. And Ehrman and I were both part of that forum, and uh, who else? Glenn Fricker? Yep, um, uh, Nolly Misha, Nolly. obviously Andy Sneep himself, he Colin Richardson. Yes. Joey Sturgis. Yes. Oh man, everybody. Neil Kernan came through a few yes, times. Exactly. So many people. It was an amazing forum. And at that time, like from 2001 up until like, when did it actually go downhill? Was that like 2010? Oh, that, maybe? That's, that's pretty vague. I think like towards the mid 2000s, maybe, yeah. or like the, the late 2000s. But, but I must say, like, personally, that forum has been a huge part of where I am today because yeah. of all the exchange of knowledge and, you know, you know, people like me, like home recording guys or amateurs could ask professionals like Andy Sneep and uh, basically exchange knowledge on a forum. And it was very non-hostile at that time, which was, you know, nowadays you get a shit, you know, you, know, you get shit if you go up there and uh, post your uh, mix or whatever. But back then, if I posted <laughs> a mix, you know, people would give good criticism and, you know, basically you just built yourself uh, in that situation. And, and Ehrman was one of the guys that in my eyes, you know, was the one, one guys that actually made it work as a producer. You were working as an engineer producer and all the other guys were basically like, you know, home recording guys. Yeah, yeah. Well, I needed it because I was in Australia. So I had no way to break out of where I was. Like mm -hmm. I had no traditional intern sort of a, a model to go through a studio and get to the big leagues, if you want to call it that. So exactly. I relied on that forum for networking, for jobs, for yes. meeting guys like yourself. Obviously, yes. that, that worked out really well for everybody here. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm completely with you. That was a complete golden age. And I think the forum format is something we've definitely lost. I mean, it's treasured for me because you could have long-winded conversations about a topic. It isn't just like, there was nuance. It wasn't just dot points like Twitter or Facebook. And it, the conversation didn't get lost after a day. No. You could always search for it and find it and build on it. If you remember Glenn Fricker, before he was Glenn Fricker, he had the Clayman thread, which was like, how do we mic things like Studio Fredman? Right. You know, so there was like a thread that went for 10 years of everybody adding yes. like, yeah, this is how we mic, you know, the guitar cab to sound like Studio Fredman. And it was just exactly. all kinds of things like that. You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah it's, it's awesome that you said that because it's, in the same way, like you said, you built your business uh, around that. I think I built my kind of name, you know, by recording amplifiers and eventually I started doing my videos and whatnot and, you know, shared them there and in a production manner, I would say. So it's, uh, yeah, it's funny to hear and see that, you know, Glenn, very successful YouTuber and yeah. Joey Sturgis, obviously very successful and all these other guys that kind of like are on the rise, they all started on that forum. In the same way, I was also part of a forum for John Petrucci. Yeah, right. And there was a bunch of players there, you know, Andy James, for instance, right. and uh, right. uh, Jason Richardson. All wow. those guys 
and Rick Graham. I think all those guys came from that forum as well. So well, it's, uh, yeah, I, I have no idea how it is on forums now today, to be honest. Have you checked into the Andy Sneak forum in a while? God, no. I wouldn't do that to myself these <laughs> days. I, I can't, I can't um, crap on its memory. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. Yeah, no, it was a great place. And it's funny that you mentioned that about those guitar players. because I two, think two I, seconds. I think I was, um, I saw that Pliny had actually been a guy who had been playing demos on sevenstring.org or something like that. Yes. Somebody was saying that he started there just doing these bedroom demos. Yes. And out of nowhere, just a, another guy out of Sydney, uh, I think Sydney, Australia, just popped out of nowhere and became like this worldwide kind of guitar star as well. And it's, it's amazing how these forums are amazing. It makes so much sense because if you're trying to be in the audio industry, the single most important thing you have available to you is networking. Like if, if you're not able to network, it doesn't matter how good you are, nobody knows how good you are. So those gave us the platform to actually get to know each other and actually create something special out of everything. Exactly, and I think like th there was this handful of kings yeah. of the Andy uh, Sneap forum that everyone, you know, <laughs> had been there for a long while and you know, it was just consistent with, sure. with content and whatnot. And it was you, it was like a Brett. A yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I, I always remember everyone in their usernames. But like all these guys, you know, obviously Andy was there and, uh, you know, it was Goddamn Guitar, which was my name. Yeah. And uh, Glenn was there. It, it, it's just we, like... We had Shane from um, Cat's Rock yes, plugins and exactly, stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, man, so many. I'm forgetting so many as well. Yeah, it it hurts. <laughs> uh, and you meet... The fun thing is you meet all these guys at NAMM and things. It's like, oh, shit, yeah. Look, we're like brothers. Yeah. We haven't met, but, I, you know, we know each other. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, it was a really excellent community. And obviously it became too big. Uh, after a while, and every, but then again, everyone branched out and did their own thing, which I guess is uh, really cool. So, going from that to uh, Master of the Universe, my solo album that you can buy somewhere. <laughs> I'll, I'll send the link somewhere. You know, you've been doing Fear a couple of times and Master and all that, and I've always had a problem with mixing. Sure. Uh, it's kind of been my struggle. I thought I could do a mix, then I mix, it sounds like ass, and I usually give it to someone else. That's kind of like the, yeah. the whole procedure of everything I do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think you you master rejects, rejects, rejects. Yes, exactly. Which was my terrible mix. <laughs> but uh, and after that, I think you did um, Cinder. Cinder, yes, yeah, which Cinder. was stem mastering. Yes. And trying to just save my mix. That, that's, been, that's been our relationship so far. Yeah. But salvage on <laughs> on master of the universe you got a chance to at least mix and master. That was fantastic. It was great to finally get there. Yes, and it's it's such a relief for me because, you know. <laughs> it's a relief for me too. Because I, 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 in general, I hate people and working with people because uh, the problem is when you start working with other people and you have this idea of you want something to sound like you, uh, you know, you have a picture of something and then you give it to someone that totally goes the other way. Of course, and of course. You, I, I, it, it has happened before, but here, it felt like you really took it and you made it better than I expected, which is like, it's, that's people you want to work with, right? <laughs> so this is a really good commercial for oh, Army right now. But that, that's how I felt like you, you took what I wanted and made it huge sounding. And um, I'm, I'm very happy with the outcome of this album. And from now on, Irma will probably mix all of my shit. Yes. Win. Finally got there. <laughs> it only took like 16 years or something before exactly. we got there. Exactly. It's trust, guys. But, uh, it takes time to build. <laughs> yeah, it takes time to build. But uh, I would say it's Master of the Universe album is not an easy album to mix because it's all over the place. It's just, I mean, it's rather than like if you would do a Feared album, you yeah. know, it's bass, it's rhythm guitars, drums and vocals and yeah. solos, and that's basically it. But yeah. here you have piano and saxophone and, saxophone right. and, uh, and making all of that balanced is like, it's incredible. Like, how, how is it possible? How, like, what do you think is the fundamentals of making an album like this sound good today? Yes. The biggest question in the universe, I would yes, say. Yes, yes. How do we get a good mix for cheap? Yeah, exactly. So uh, tell everyone, how do you mix? How do we mix? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it was really great in this case because I think you caught me at a really good time, first mm -hmm. of all. Um, I've been mostly mastering ever since we did Periphery 3 back in 2015-ish, mm -hmm. 16, whatever it was. 
So that actually gave me an opportunity to work with a lot of different styles of music. Yep. So primarily that was amazing because I got to go in with a headspace of, I have no control over how this sounds. All I can do is like marginally make things better, clear up the edges and, and help these guys realize their vision. Yep. So when you came to me with this completely different solo record, I was in a mindset of, I, I'm not trying to imprint anything onto your sound. Mm -hmm. I'm literally just trying to do what I think you're aiming for stylistically yep. and to bring that to life. The amazing thing about that is you have to go through periods of being horrible before you get there. And I've done this like many, many years ago, back when we were going through the um, the Rise Core sound. I, I over edited, I over punched in, I over produced everything. And I listen back to those albums now and it hurts. It like, it just hurts my soul. Yeah. It's one thing I didn't want to do on your record was yeah. imprint any of that sort of stuff. Right. I know that you're big on recording everything in the moment, like your demo yes. takes become the actual album takes. Yes. And even that attitude alone tells me, all right, I need to like be conducive to what you're doing. There's no way that I'm going to go in there and like move the drums around and like lock stuff yes. to the grid. It is what it is. And yeah, I've given you like a long winded, not useful explanation for mixing, but when you spend 15 years mixing, you'll understand and you'll agree with me. Yeah, so, exactly. I mean, even, even if you like, if you cut up and place things around, I mean, then it's just all about the sound, yep. and not about the performance that much. I mean, personally, I've always been like the, you know, I like when things uh, hurt your ears, like in a, in a way where it, it's very you know, Swedish. it's very Swedish. Yeah, but when, you know, it's not perfect. It's like it's it's a, it's a jagged uh, stone, if you or like a jewel or whatever. I, I like that more because you know it, those little scratches and things. Th those are the things that makes the album uh, personal and different from all these perfectionist albums that yeah. are out there. Yeah. So it's um, yeah, it's nice to hear that you. Now, I mean, after all these years, I know what you're saying because I was also doing that, you know, sitting and editing, you know, recording. That's not fun, is it? Re recording verses and like riff in verses and then just copy, paste and yeah. whatnot. And it's like, it, it's, there's one good thing about it. It's time efficient if you copy and all that, sure. which is good, but it removes some of that heart in some way. Of course. So, um, yeah, it's just a little side note there. So. Okay, but you didn't really ask, uh, answer the question because I was ask, <laughs> asking, yes. what makes a good mix today? Oof, that's rough. I mean, all of my reference records, I think the newest one is like 2010. I still, I still reference um, uh, Alice in Chains, Black mm. Gives Way to Blue, um, Behemoth's, um, not Demigod, but um, Evangelion. Yes. So records like that. So my reference records basically stopped in the like, in the late 2000s, early 2010s. Yep. So I can't actually tell you what makes a good record today. I mean, I most of the things I listen to are things that I'm sent to work on from guys like Nolly mm -hmm. and um, Pliny and whomever else. So I kind of, I keep abreast of the tra the, the traditions and like the, the fads and the trends of production through that. But um, I would say what makes it in this day and age is not, it's, that, it's the opposite to that mid 2000s sound. It's not over processing. It's basically not making stuff sound super sterile because guys like Nolly will produce with very natural drums. Like if he can get away with it, he'll keep completely natural drums. Um, because of like time convenience and just portability and everything, most of us work almost entirely in the box these days. So there's very yeah. little analog gear as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, that that it kind of hurts me a little because I was a purist analog guy. I still love tube amps. Yes. I love real compressors and all that sort of yes. stuff. But the practicalities of working with that kind of gear in this day and age, they're just not, not there anymore. Yeah. So I think, yeah, being, being portable, being smart with what you're doing in the mix and keeping things a little more natural, I think. And everybody these days uses like a Kemper or an Axe FX. So they're, they're exactly. not, nobody's using tube amps anymore. So no. I don't know if you, you want to delve into that uh, and how it Yeah, to... well, uh, yeah. So, so uh, I don't think you guys noticed, but on the album, Master of the Universe, it's actually the Fortin plugin. It is. For rhythm guitars. It is. And uh, why, I mean, I love tubes, tube amps as well, but I think one, we were half short on time, and two, it sounds kick-ass. Yeah. And why would I, yeah. you know, just reamp something to have it reamped when I can still tweak the sound while mixing yeah. and, you know, change the gain or whatever, and I don't have to re do the reamp again. Yeah. I mean, it's all about convenience. And at this point, I mean, the NTS is basically my amplifier because it's modeled. At, um, I sent my amplifier to Neural yep. and they modeled it. Yeah. I mean, that's it, it my is. amp. Yeah. So there, there you go. go. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that in that sense, 
I'm not saying that I will never record an amplifier again because, but for this album, I just felt like, ah, that's that's fucking it right there. Yeah. Like, why would I just to be anal about me? I have to use a, a real tube amplifiers. No, this is. I, it, it it was a really nice moment for me where I could say like, I don't give a shit actually. As long as it sounds good, I don't have to be be this uh, <laughs> anal tube amp guy anymore. You know, you just. I, Whatever sounds good and works. I think in that sense, we're both in the same headspace. Like yeah. I was saying, like I really didn't care how it turned out stylistic as so long as it worked with what you were doing. Yes. And you were obviously in that same headspace where I think this is one of the first times in my life I've actually used an amp simulator on a final product and yeah. not like torn my hair out over it, you know? Yes. But it's just, it sounds so good. Yeah. The guys are amazing to work with. Yes. Uh, it, it's based on your amp. And I mean, it gives us this amazing working dichotomy where you can provide me essentially final sounds yeah. that are pre-processed that you like already yeah. and there's way less guesswork between us because if yes. I was trying to reamp it through my tube amps I reckon like 8 out of 10 times you'd be like oh this needs more gain yes. or a bit more hair yeah. or less or yeah. more of this that is a hairy process this reamping and just getting it it, yeah. it sucks it really yeah. does that's why um, I mean I've never really liked reamping even yeah. when we were using tube amps like the idea was always to get a guitarist in a studio have yeah. him play through the tone and that way you've got that symbiotic relationship between of oh, Whoa. yes awkward yeah. Ehrman love it. First, first in coffee with Ola, uh, Erman's oh. spilling coffee on himself. <laughs> with a half, half empty mug. Yeah, less. exactly. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> I'll drink the rest so I don't do this again. <laughs> but if you would use a tube amplifier, what would be your favorite amplifier? Oh man. For metal guitar, sorry. Th this is really easy. This is very, very easy. So we, we had a studio a couple of years back. We had a collection of different tube amplifiers. Mm. And uh, I would say 90% of the time on any high gain rhythm guitar context, the EVH 5153 100 watt just slayed everything. Yes. It just, when you put them side by side in a blind shootout, it's yeah. just no contest. Yeah. And uh, it pains me being an old PV guy. Yeah. It's just better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's actually, that's a very uh, easy sell as well. I mean, a lot of people are asking, like, oh, what should I get for an amplifier? I mean, if you just want a good and like really awesome metal amplifier that's easy to just plug in and play, it's the fucking EVH. Yeah. It's, it's already. For me, that's still a new amplifier, even yeah, though it's yeah, been yeah, out for like too. a lot of years. But it's already a standard. It's in the same way as a dual rectifier on the PV5150. Yes. So EVH50. Have you tried the EL34 version? No, never. How is it? Really? It's nice. Really? It's does nice. it tame down that red channel a little bit so it's less hairy? Uh, I think it becomes a little bit more uh, harsh, actually. Oh, wow. In a good way. That, that Swedish thing coming through again. You guys want that, that freaking metal zone. We want that, thing. that hurt in yeah, our ears. Yeah. <laughs> because we already blew our ears, so we need more of that just to have the same kind of tone like you do. Um, okay, so Andy Sneep yeah. is like the common thing right here. What is your favorite Andy Sneep sounding album? Yeah, man, he's got so many though, doesn't he? So many great sounding records. And it's like, what era do you go for? Like the super early, like digital sounding stuff? Yeah. Or like the mid era Arch Enemy, um, mm. what was that record? Doomsday, Doomsday Machine? Yeah. That, that's amazing. I, I, I spun the crap out of that Doomsday is album. Uh, one of my top like, yeah. overall sounding albums. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just, good. I mean, on a technical level, if you were to like really get into it, there are flaws if you want to call them that but I mean there's so much character in it yes. and, and that's what I'm starting to appreciate more and more about exactly Andy's style. and that's the thing about like uh, uh, the gathering testament yeah like it's not a perfect album no. it's a fucking uh, you know it's a, a rehearsal train. it's a rehearsal yeah, room exactly. recording. Yeah. but you know it gives that album such a character yeah and such a drive and brutality and that's why I like that one so much because it sounds so much different from the rest of Andy Sneap's work. Yes. Where it's more, you know, perfect and polished. Yes. And uh, well, I think it's because he was forced into that arrangement. He yeah. had to go to their rehearsal room in the U.S. Yeah. And basically had to use what they had available, which was yes. like a Beta 57 instead of a regular SM57. I think they had triple rectifiers, and I don't think he would ever have recorded rhythm guitars with a triple rectifier no. otherwise. So it, it, I think being forced out of your comfort zone like that is an amazing thing. Yeah. And again, why I appreciated the way that we worked, because you yeah. would feed me your tones. And it's like, this is the tone. I have no say over what it is beyond how it sits in the mix. I think that's a really good arrangement to have with an artist. Yeah. yeah. But then again, I mean, the cool thing here with us using plugins now is that basically I could have just sent you the DI and just sent you my setting. And then you can tweak Very a little true. bit around Very that. True. And it, I mean, to be able to work like that, it's amazing. Yes. And uh, I mean, I personally love this era as being a guitar player and a producer because, you know, there's just, everything's out there yeah. and it's easy and it's, uh, it, it's amazing. 
And um, yeah, it's a great era for that sort of stuff. And I'm actually going to completely derail your train of conversation here because you were asking me about um, my favorite amps, right? Yeah. So the EVH is the amp that technically sounds the best for everything, but then there's the amp I love the most, which you actually introduced me to with oh. your, one of your very earliest videos, which is the uh, Framus Cobra. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, very early Ola, before there was any talking or personality or, you know, nice golden locks of hair. Uh, there was locks in there, but <laughs> no personality, I agree. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that amp, when yeah. I heard your playthrough video, I'm like, nothing else sounds like this. It's like an attack of angry bees yeah. or something, and it's like, my God, yeah. the, the top end is so hard, yet yet beautiful at the same time. And uh, to this day, it's actually my favorite bass amp. So, oh, there you go. Yeah, if any of you guys have actually used um, my plugin, the Eurobass 2, you've actually heard the Framus Cobra on there. I love it on the uh, distortion settings of That's that awesome. thing. So. I think that that video was kind of like a lucky break, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you, I mean, my approach for recording amp demos is basically, I take the amplifier, I have a cabinet, and I just basically shove the microphone in there. Right, and right. I don't really sit and do much to you know find a spot. Just worked out. Because you know, my problem is that I, I try not to sound the same all the time. And the cabinet spot is like, okay, if I just place it differently every, every time, the tones are gonna be different, even though you know it's a different amplifier. So I think I just had a lucky break with that one where I really like stuck into the exact <laughs> right spot to make it sound super awesome. Yeah, guessing on that amp it would have been somewhere really far off axis that would have sounded horrible with every other amp, but because it's Probably. so harsh, it just and, worked. And the, it's funny because that amp is matched with uh, the Frames Cobra uh, okay. 4x12, which ah. has Jensen speakers in it. Or no? N no, no, it has greenbacks in it. Greenbacks, okay, sorry. Because uh, I, I tried it. We actually ended up getting our Cobra with the, the matching yes. cab. And I've got to say, it's the single worst constructed cab I've ever used in my Perfect. entire life. It <laughs> sounded like you were running a phaser in slow motion oh. in there. It was just disgusting. So Great. my uh, my studio partner, being the whiz that he is, is like, well, why don't we just grab these speakers and throw them into the Mesa Eversize? Yes. And that was the birth of some yeah. serious magic. Like the greenbacks plus the Cobra, and bass of all things yeah. are like the best sound ever. Yeah. So gotcha. Yeah, that's. A I mean, trick. I think the I think the greenbacks combo. I mean, it feels like the amp was made for the greenbacks because yes. I remember in the room and trying different speakers, it didn't really sound that good. But then, as you soon as you tried it with a matched greenbacks, it actually opened up and sounded really good. Yeah, agreed. Which is a problem because everyone's using V30s and T75s. At least I do. T75s? I thought they fell out of fashion in like the 90s or something, or, yeah. I'm out of fashion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that, that was the first speaker I ever mic'd up as a kid. Yeah. So that, that to me was the sound of an amp, a T75. And yeah. like, cause I, you know, you and I listen to a lot of Destroy, Raise, Improve, yes. and that sort of stuff. Yes. To me, that is like, oh. That I was is just about to say that actually, that, that particular cabinet. Yeah, right. The uh, Frederick's cab. Because you guys used that, didn't you? Like, you, you played through it a few times. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's here in the country somewhere. Obviously. Oh, yeah, it's in the Meshuggah studio. I've seen it and played through it a bunch of times. Oh, man. It's a legend. Oh, man. This old 1960, I think, Marshall yeah. Cab. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it all has all the tape from all the old recordings, so, like, you know, exactly all the where settings. The, yeah, all wow. the settings for the cabinet. That would be like a pilgrimage for me to, like, Mecca or something, like, to see that cab, you know, the sound of your childhood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why I like it. I think I have, in this camera right here, it's a Hesu, it's a V30 and a T75 combo in oh, that one. That's really good. They work well together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just a good combination if you want to have, you know, two different microphones. Yeah. They, I think they complement each other really yeah. well. I mean, just because something is out of vogue doesn't mean it stops sounding good. You know, it's just people no. go through fashions and trends of guitar sounds. Yes. And I would say the mid-2000s were that massive 1V30 one SM57, and, direct yeah. on. And I think that is Andy Sneep's fault, probably. Well, it came from Colin Richardson, didn't it? Yeah, it but there. I think Andy did all, you know, he did Nevermore, he did everyone. I mean, at some point, it all kind of sounded almost the same. Sure, uh, except for Dead Heart and A Dead World, yes. the T75s, the yes, dual wreck, yeah. Exactly. Remember how much we used to talk about that album back in the that, day? That's my favorite guitar <laughs> tone album right there. That's and a good one. That, that's like a mecca. I, I've already done my, my research on that one right, because I right, made a right. video of it. Right, right. But uh, that, is, that is the epiphany of tone right there. It's just right. like, oh, I love that sound. And I talked to Jeff and, you know, he used really thick low string. That's why it's so... Balsy. And That's right, he used to use a 70, didn't he? And I remember I used to buy it. 80. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, and man. He, he, he's probably the only guy who can pull it off in that wow. tuning. But it, that's why it sounds so balsy. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you're just doing fucking pinch harmonics on the 80 strings. Like. <laughs> but that's Jeff. <laughs> that, that, that dude's a complete god. Like, yeah. serious childhood hero. I think I uh, 
Am I sitting in the same chair that he was sitting in? Where did no, you guys do No, your... because uh, we did it at NAMM. <sighs> Sorry, coffee with all at NAMM. But maybe Damn. I'll have him here when Arch Enemy is playing here. That's awesome. You can so. tell him that he's sitting in Ermin's chair and then he can be starstruck. I could. Yeah. I could. Yeah. I could, exactly. Awesome. Okay, so if you're in like a, a Mel band and you're recording at home and you want help with mixing or mastering, what is like the biggest mistake or mistakes that bands do today when they send you stuff for mastering, for instance? Oh, how long do you have? How long do these videos go for? <laughs> like the, just the, like the key points. What do you see like is sure. the general problem or mistake that people do when they try to mix their own shit? People are not very mindful of minutia, I find. So okay. the, the little things that are very obvious when you've been an engineer for over a decade, yeah. such as pitch, pitch is so important, mm -hmm. right? There's timing, but there's also the things that they don't understand. And, and something that listening to guys like Jeff Loomis can really help you with is just the intensity and cleanliness of playing. Because okay. Jeff doesn't just play a riff, he plays a riff, yeah, like he, he gets it. in there. And it's like the performance is a part of like his style as well. As you were saying, not many people can play with an 80, right? No, no. So it's, it's things like that and definitely pitch. I think a lot of guitar players don't actually understand what being in tune actually is, especially because yeah. that instrument is such a clusterfuck. I hope I can swear on here. Yeah, but, right. uh, because the frets are all kind of in and out of alignment, right? Unless you've got the, was it true temperament, yeah, squiggly exactly. fret action, yeah. unless you've got like ever tune holding you in pitch. Basically, um, depending on the section that you're recording, if mm. you're playing a really fast thrashy riff, yep. you're better off actually detuning the guitar slightly because yes. you're knocking it up in pitch and then therefore you'll be at zero. Yes. But then the moment you start holding chords, you're gonna be flat again. So I think one thing that people don't realize is you have to record section by section, yes. not because you're a bad player, but because the instrument is imperfect, yeah. right? So it's just little things like that that add up over the course of recording. Right. It might be sent that, you know, on, on, across all the guitar tracks, and by the time eight of them have been layered, whether it be the octave lead guitars, the rhythms, the actual solo, everything's out of tune. Yeah. And it's, there's nothing I can do as a mix engineer no. to fix that sort of stuff. Exactly. So I think be mindful of the minutia and uh, try and read as many experienced guides as you can about this sort of stuff, because you're not gonna know everything from scratch. You, you will need help from somebody to let you know what to pay attention to. Yeah, that's a good tip, and uh, it's I I see it because I I do struggle with that as well. Right. I mean, it doesn't even like the, the the good thing with like an EverTune is that it actually helps a little bit with that. I mean, you can set it like if you're really gonna thrash out, like balls out, and you know you're gonna play really hard and technicality and you know really weird stretches, and you push the you know you're like a really weird chord where your pinky just pushes a little bit too hard yeah, and it goes yeah. uh, you know. Fuck, not sharp. flat, but sharp. And, uh, <laughs> wow, forget that. But, but you know how it is. But the Evertune, if you set it for recording as to not do that, you, it saves you a lot of hassle, actually. And same for like clean passages, which is also like a, a nightmare to record if you're using really complex chords. Absolutely. The Evertune bridge really helps with that. And it, it's, it, it just makes life a little bit easier. Well, it's good that you're mentioning that here. This is the first place you actually demoed the Evertune to me many, many years ago now. So to me, the Evertune is still new, but you actually showed me like six years ago or whatever it was. Yeah. Exactly. So to me, it's still mind blowing, the concept that you can have something tension balanced, yep. that no matter how hard you dig in or whether you bend or not, it's still just at the same pitch. Yep. For recording, that's invaluable. You yeah. can't go past that. It that is. will save you so much time. Yeah. That's what I've been saying. Like uh, um, if you, you're a home recording musician, have at least one Evertune guitar. Yeah. Just for like the, you know, like the, the workhorse guitar, basically. Yeah, yeah. Just, and then you can find, if you really want to have a Floyd or whatever, you just record in that part, do that Floyd, and the rest you just use the Everton Bridge. I mean, some people like Mark Lewis swear that it steals tone. I know, I, I, he, he did. And the fun thing is that he mixed and mastered the uh, Fear yes, Dub. Yes, he did. Yeah. And when he made that post, right, and like, oh, it steals the tone, it sounds sh like shit, I'm like, but you told me the, the tone on the, the, my good. album was, was one of the best you ever made. It's like, oh, was that ever tune? Oh, shit, okay. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. I, I think that people have... Predisposition bias. They have, and obviously they probably tried a guitar. I think like some guitars with ever tune, they, they don't work that well. Sure. So I still think that a lot of installers and builders are not really installing them correctly. Right. So there's better guitars with ever tune and there's the best ones and the worst one. And so, he probably just had a really bad Evertune experience, right. which could happen. So, so buy solo guitars, they're, they're installed yes. correctly from you the factory. You heard it. But, yeah, well, amazing. Yes. <laughs> no, but... We, uh, we watch out for each other, man. Sneak by the bros, you know, that's, that's all. Good, I like that. But uh, no, I had uh, Evertune, I actually had two Strictly 7 guitars that I equipped 
with Evertune. So right, like a right. after installment or whatever. And one of them became completely dead sounding. Wow. And uh, it sounded like shit. And the other one was, was fine. Oh. But I never really had that problem if it was a guitar which was installed uh, with from the, the Evertune factory. from the factory or something. Right, right, right. Cool. So, so I think it's like a, people are still kind of, when the Evertune was new, people had no idea how to install it. Now it's kind of like it was a learning curve and now they're getting into it and understand how it works. So now it's a lot better, actually. And uh, yeah, totally recommend. If you want to have a good studio workhorse guitar, just getting an Evertune guitar is the shit. Yeah. Preferably a solar guitar. <laughs> Solarguitars.com. In stock, <laughs> shipping within 48 hours. <laughs> Rough. <laughs> um, I was about to ask you about the systematic mixing guide yeah, that you have going. Yeah, going back a while, yeah. That's a while ago. And do I have a quote in there? Maybe? On the site. On the, okay, You're website. helping me sell it, whether you know it or not. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. Ehrman has a, a really good mixing guide going, and uh, it's called the Systematic Mixing Guide. Yes, <laughs> it is. Great. Yeah, it's easy. And uh, it's basically just straight up really good tips for mixing metal, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, you can extrapolate it to other genres too, mostly band-based music, yeah. I would say. So if you're recording... But it's really like hands-on, like yeah. do this. Yeah. And yeah. it's, you know, just remove this yeah. because this frequency sucks. It, it, it's, and it's like, that's it. It's just like <laughs> someone just telling you what to do. And if you do like what Ehrman tells you to do, it will sound good. Yeah, kind of like that, that. that was exactly the idea. Because when I went through school, um, audio school, I was told to buy this book, which cost an ungodly amount of money. Mm. And I read the book and the guy's just like, we have a guitar cabinet in front of you, right? And think of what it expulses as like a dispersion of colors that concentrate and, and come apart in different places. And I'm like, I haven't done nearly enough LSD to understand what yeah. wavelength this guy is on. And I'm yeah. like, so I'm gonna write a book, which is the kind that I needed when I was starting. Yes. Because I actually, I'm not sure if you remember this, but Andy Sneap had an EQ Bible out in yes. the very early 2000s. Yes. When I didn't know what the hell I was doing, as I was mixing, I would have that alt tabs in like a notepad yes. document. I'm just like, oh, 10 kilohertz Same. boost for air on pianos. Yeah. And it's just that sort of Same. stuff. Same. That's, that's exactly what I wanted the mixing guide to be like, but about every instrument, so you knew exactly what you were doing and yes. for what reason. Yeah. So that, that was the prime kind of ethos behind that sort of book. Awesome. Do you have any plans to kind of like extend the, or like expand yeah, yeah. the guide? Uh, the, the new one, the new guide, which is actually the recording guide, I have 70% written back home oh. in, in Melbourne. So Shit. yeah, I haven't, awesome. I haven't spoken about it too much, but yeah, there's a second book coming. So you heard it here first. Wow, amazing. All News England. on the Coffee Ola. <laughs> Ola England. <laughs> Positive Ola, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, second book, man. I, um, I'm starting to do a bit more uh, YouTube content. I think yep. in this day and age, people are preferring the visual or yes. the visual thing. Yes. You know, not, this isn't an indication of that at all. Um, so uh, pe People just don't want to read. They, yeah. You know, people like podcasts and being read to them. Of course. I think YouTube is a good uh, it's a good platform. I, just I mean, we're all busy these days. We've all got things to do. Yeah. Not everybody has like you know the, however many hours it takes to read through a book and remember it. Yeah. So it's sometimes easier to watch the video and remember oh, yeah. that. So yeah. the the videos I'm doing are essentially like small encapsulations of things that we cover in the books already. Yeah. So it's just little little ways to like you know how to mix a bass guitar or yeah. how to mix good rhythm guitars or sometimes we actually tie it into some of our friends. Like very recently, I did a, a video on how to get a you know a nice lead sound mm -hmm. using the archetype Pliny plugin oh, okay. from Neural DSP. Oh, and that kind of helps everyone. It's like a great plugin. I can kind of show the plugin and yeah. I can show how to actually dial it for people as well that may not have you know a good idea. And the great thing is the better these tools get, the less I have to do. So sometimes yeah. I don't even have to mix anything. I'm yeah. just like pulling up a that preset. Yeah, yeah. And then that's pretty much perfect. So, that's awesome. Yeah. So uh, you also talked about bass guitar you just released yeah. Oh shit, I just dropped the name. What's the name? What's the name <laughs> the, of the, the plugin? The instrument or the, or the, or the brand? The, the bass instrument. Eurobass. Eurobass. Because we're in Europe and that's why. Exactly. And I made a demo out of it. And uh, it's, I guess, the first real bass replacement instrument that there, I mean, I know about Trillion back in the day, but that was shit basically. Uh, for, for metal, it was shit. Don't sue me, I didn't But say basically, uh, Eurobass is just a really, the perfect mix tool if you're, you don't want to record your bass. Yeah. And the cool thing about this is that, that I, what I personally loved about it is that it's perfectly in tune, which is a problem with bass guitar. Yes. Like, when is it in tune? When is it not in tune? I mean, I have struggles. When you're down in like drop A and trying to tune a bass guitar, you know, everything sounds either in tune or out of tune. Yeah. So it's like, I can go from, um, from a drop A, like, okay, this sounds in tune and I can just go a little sharp. It's like, 
oh, it still sounds in tune. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> am yeah, I in or not? Yeah. Like, so, so with that said, the Eurobass was just really good um, for me, like a good tune guide, actually, to know if I was out of tune or not with the guitar. That's, it's fascinating because we don't actually use that as one of the bullet points for selling the product, but it's a really practical way to think of it. It is. And, and it's something I heard not only from you, but Jason Sukoff just started mm. using it. And the first thing he told me was, dude, I love this for pre-production because I have all my guitar players lay down their guitar tracks to this perfectly in tune bass. Yes. And if it sounds out, then I know that it's out, right? Exactly. And that's, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad. That's actually an update that came in the Eurobass 2, which we released recently. Mm. The original one wasn't actually artificially tuned to be perfect. Okay. The original one, I, I tried to get through sounding a little bit more natural, mm -hmm. but the one thing we didn't think about is the fact that it's performance-based, right? Yes. So if I tune it slightly sharp and you're playing really fast, yeah. then it's always going to be sharp, yes. whereas, you know, all that sort of stuff. So exactly. I'm glad we fixed that on, on the new plugin. And I'm good. glad that you liked it. Oh, positive yeah. Ola. It's perfect. Yeah. Positive Ola. <laughs> and I have it on my laptop now, so now whenever I'm out, uh, you know, when I was in Australia, yeah. I, had, I can program some bass. Because otherwise, I would just record a, a guitar and tune it down and put a bass plug in on it. It sounds like that, ass. That's not the way to go. But <laughs> this is really, this like, okay, so this is really good because now I can have, you know, my own drummer and my own bass player <laughs> and uh, I don't need to work with more people, yeah. which tell, is excellent. It's, well, well, tell me, how did the bass players feel about this? Uh, uh, obviously, uh, I mean, I, I the, you know how it is. They feel betrayed. But yeah. it's it's fine. I, they, they understand my joke about it. Sure. And, sure. Uh, well, for what it's worth, I felt betrayed by their performances over the last fifteen exactly, years of my life. Exactly. So you know, just do better, and you won't need tools like this. Exactly. That's that's it right there. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. This has been Airman of uh, Systematic Audio and sub Submission Audio. Submission Audio. Oh, no, no, we'll, we'll get it right. It's okay. Systematic Productions and Submission Audio. Yes. Thank you so much. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice to have you here in Sweden. A pleasure, man. Thank you very uh, much. How's the weather? Me. It's nice and warm in here outside, a different story. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I <laughs> right. think I'm already getting sick, but that's a different oh, nice. story. Maybe that's the cat. I, I'm, I'm like, I'm crying right now. I, yeah, I your, think eye, it, your eye looks really fucked yeah, up. Yeah, I am fucked up. Yeah. I think and it's, it's the eye that's on the camera as well, so that's I know. great. This one, I'm going to zoom that in. But I thought it was Poland. Uh, you know, outside because we have uh, Birch Poland happening right now, right. which kind of like uh, fucking fucks me all, all over. <laughs> but I think it's the fucking cat that I'm, <laughs> my, my brother's cat. Fuck that cat. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering Shit. why you've been looking at me with this crazy yeah, eye. Yeah, yeah, I don't do drugs, even though it looks like it. <laughs> but anyways, what the fuck am I talking about? Or are we talking about? Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>